Hi everybody, I'm Brittany Lewis, a breaking news reporter here at Forbes. Joining me now is Cameron Porter, co-lead investor of Transmutex. Cameron, thanks for coming on in. Thank you for having me here, Brittany. I'm excited for the conversation today because really within the past few years, we've seen this paradigm shift as the world continues to embrace AI. However, powering the AI revolution does require a lot of energy and that's where Transmutex does come in. So explain what Transmutex does and how this contributes to the conversation. Look, thank you again for having me here, Brittany, to talk about this, I think, very important issue, especially with the elections coming up, because AI is critical not only for enterprise applications, but also military applications. It's really a question of national security. And if we want to have the AI deployments that we're looking for, we need energy. And we need energy that we can produce domestically here in the U.S. and very reliably at scale. And really the only way to do that is with nuclear. But we've seen nuclear deployments try to scale in the past, and those were held back for a variety of reasons, including safety and waste. And really what we at Transmutex and as investors in that company are, are looking to do is develop a system that addresses those core problems. And the way we do that is by using an advanced particle accelerator technology that's really unique to Transmutex. So you brought up national security, so let's dive right into that bucket first. As we know, energy and national security are deeply connected. We saw this most recently play out in the Russia-Ukraine war. So talk about where the United States is specifically in the race for nuclear energy. Look, the U.S. was the leader. We developed nuclear energy as a part of the Manhattan Project. Now, the challenge has been is that we've scaled back our investment in those programs. Countries like China today, both on the fission and fusion side, are investing more dollars in the U.S. Russia also has particularly aggressive programs with their company called Rosatom for deploying reactors globally in countries like Egypt, Bangladesh, Turkey. And it's really a part of their foreign policy. How do you gain influence? You deploy reactors, you control energy systems, so on and so forth. And then to the U.S.'s credit, and to the IAEA and other international organizations, we've been making sure to help prevent proliferation, so deploying nuclear systems that can be used to make bombs. But this is kind of a cat and mouse game, is if we don't help get nuclear to countries that need it, the energy that they need, then all of a sudden you're allowing an opportunity for countries like Russia and China to control those systems. And so a system like Transmutex is uniquely positioned to give the West an opportunity to counter these pressures. Because Transmutex's system uses a particle accelerator, it's non-proliferant, which means it can't be used to make bomb-making material, and therefore you can deploy these systems in more countries across the global south, as well as use them in the U.S. and other domestic Western markets. So essentially, break this down in simple terms, Transmutex does recycle nuclear waste and then reuses that as nuclear energy. Yeah, this is one of the unique things that is enabled by having a particle accelerator that powers a nuclear reactor. Instead of just being reliant on enriched uranium, which the U.S. bought a lot from Russia in the past and still does today, despite recent legislation, uh, Transmutex's system allows you to use a variety of different fuels, including existing nuclear waste. And so when you put that waste into the system, it's transmuted, hence Transmutex, which means it's burnt and destroyed. And what comes out is energy and actually fuel that can be used in existing nuclear reactors. So all of a sudden, not only you're destroying your waste stockpiles, which are one of the most costly things to store. We had a hundred billion dollar project in the US to store our existing waste that got shut down under Obama after spending $15 billion. Uh, and so Transmutex's system is kind of the natural complement to a nuclear fuel cycle. We destroy the waste, we produce energy, and we provide fuel that isn't enriched uranium that needs to come from Russia. You just said a few hefty price tags with the B word, billion. <laughs> and one of the biggest complaints from critics when it comes to nuclear energy or clean energy is, this is, yes, great for the environment, but it also comes at a really heavy price tag. What do you say to that? I think you have to remember the time scales that you're investing on, especially when it comes to nuclear. These plants are certified to operate for 40 years with their first license, and many of them operate for up to 80 years. So even though you may be talking about a $2 billion, $5 billion, $10 billion facility, these things are providing gigawatts of energy for decades, and that's very unique. Uh, once you make those investments, you have countries, economies, cities benefiting for a very, very long time. And this is really one of the strengths of nuclear. Uh, if we look at solar fields, like those may last for 20 years. And then you're talking about massive, massive fields of material that need to be replaced, reused, recycled, so on and so forth. And so I think when you're looking at these high price tags, you have to remember you're buying energy security for a very long time. I want to talk about the political implications here. First, I know that you had a conversation with Congressman Bill Foster last month. How did that go? And give us a pulse check here. Where is the United States when it comes to nuclear? The United States and, and congressmen, congressmen like Bill Foster are, are taking a lead here. In the sense, if you look back even to COP28, 
the U.S. led a commitment from the world to 3x nuclear by 2050. And that, that's a big commitment. But if we say, like, how are we going to actually get there? All of a sudden, we're going to run into the same issues that we've ran into the past if we're relying on the same technologies we built with nuclear bef with before. And this is what people like Congressman Foster are looking at. How do you evaluate the next generation of advanced reactors based on what type of properties and uh, opportunities they can provide to the market? Namely, how do we deal with waste? How do we source new types of fuel? And how do we develop systems that are safer so that we never have issues like Three Mile Island or Chernobyl? And that's really what the next generation of nuclear technologies can, uh, can provide. And that's why the NRC, the regulatory body for nuclear in the U.S., is now looking to amend how it actually licenses these systems so that we can bring them to market more quickly. That's an interesting point. How do you make this safer? And how do you sell this to a state, especially in the United States, when you who wants a nuclear site, a nuclear facility in their backyard because you immediately think of images like Chernobyl. So how what's the sell here? Yeah, so this is one of the major selling points of Transmutex, even relative to other advanced reactor systems. You probably hear this term critical system a lot if you start digging into nuclear, which just means is that you have a fuel that is critical. It's producing neutrons and kind of having this chain reaction that if you don't manage it, can go out of control and lead to a meltdown. That's like Chernobyl. Now, we have lots of systems that make those safe today, which creates a relatively low risk. But the best thing you could do is, how could you make a nuclear system that's subcritical, doesn't have that property? And the way you do it is actually by using a particle accelerator, which is really the core proprietary technology for transmutex. Because the particle accelerator drives the reaction, instead of enriched uranium fuel, that means that if you turn that particle accelerator off, the reaction stops immediately. This means it's incredibly safe. And so if you're looking to site a system by a city or an industrial facility or a valuable data center, you want a subcritical system. And that's really where we see the benefits of Transmutex and hopefully have a system that can be licensed more quickly than other reactors because of those safety standards. And Transmutex is a Swiss technology. So what's the timeline of this type of technology coming into the United States? Yeah, so we're hoping to develop a first-of-a-kind system, so our first full-scale deployment, in the early 2030s. Uh, we would love the U.S. to be the first market for it. Now there's other countries that are really vying for it. And the reason we're based in, in Switzerland is that ma many people have probably heard of CERN, which is the Center for Nuclear Research in Europe. They really have the largest number of particle physicists because that's where the world's largest particle accelerator is. And there's other national or federal level research labs that focus on particle physics there. And so they have that really asset of talent and technology that they're developing there and then hoping to deploy globally, including in the US. I do wanna circle back to the very beginning of our conversation about AI. When you're looking at AI expanding and growing the data centers, do need just a massive amount of energy. Can AI grow without nuclear energy? I think it can grow without nuclear energy, but it's gonna be even more costly. Uh, if you look at say solar or wind, right? Like those might be the clean alternatives where if we say we're gonna keep to our net zero commitments, we're gonna use solar and wind to power these things. But solar and wind have the issue in that they're intermittent, right? They don't run 24 seven. And so you need lots of redundancy or lots of battery deployments. That means you'd need massive solar fields to get that 99.999% uptime that's required of data centers. And so unless you have either nuclear, which is great baseload power, or natural gas, or some alternative like that, nuclear is really the only clean energy option, I think, that can get us here in a cost-effective way. Uh, and it's a thing that scales quickly. I think people kind of have this sense, or for some reason, that nuclear is slow. If we look at the United Arab Emirates, this is like one of the sunniest places in the world. They have all the capital they need to deploy either solar or nuclear. And as of today, not only do they have twice as much uh, nuclear deployed, they're investing more in nuclear than solar. And they're putting up another reactor facility, and they're looking to deploy a lot of AI. They're working with Microsoft, OpenAI, so on and so forth. You brought up the price tag again. It's a lot of money at first, but are you saying upfront it's billions, but then it's it's worth the amount of money? Yeah, I think because you're, you're amortizing that cost over, over decades. And this is really where I think government plays a part in this, is that private markets find it difficult to underwrite assets for that long period of time. So you really need government backstops to just make sure that these things are, are worthwhile investments and in case there's cost overruns, which if you look at countries like China, they're building reactors in five years without these overruns. In the US, we're just at the beginning of rebuilding this muscle. If we looked at what happened in Georgia with the first couple new reactors that just went online, they were delayed, they were over budget. 
But now we have people that are trained in building these systems. They're only going to get better as long as we build similar ones. And I think that's where the, the investment starts to pay off is as we rebuild this muscle in the, in the U.S., we're going to start to build reactors faster, cheaper, and that's going to incentivize even more private investment and drive costs down. Historically, as we've been discussing, nuclear energy progress in the United States has been slow. So how long will it take to rebuild this muscle, as you're saying? I think that we're talking about an investment, at least on the fission side, over the next 10 years. Really what's happening today is that we have large companies that are building well-known reactor systems like the AP-1000. That's what went into Georgia. And then we have a whole cadre of incredible nuclear startups, both in the U.S. and in Europe, like Transmutex. Those companies are developing and licensing these new advanced reactor technologies that may come to market in three to, to five years. Uh, through those licensing process and then we're looking at five year to seven year build times so really that's the window where we're going to see this next generation of reactors really come to market and start to influence prices and, and the ability to deploy global uh, data centers at scale this conversation's coming at a really interesting time we're less than four months away from a presidential election and it's an unprecedented presidential election in the sense of we've seen donald trump's four years we've seen president biden's four years when you're comparing the two whose energy policies do you think most likely will advance nuclear energy look i think biden has done a good job in under his administration of realizing that nuclear is a part of clean energy this wasn't the case four years ago uh, and that's why the commitments at cop 28 were important now have those commitments gone far enough in terms of how do you actually clear out regulatory challenges that have prevented new advanced reactor systems from coming to market? Maybe not. And I think when you look at Trump as a presidential candidate, definitely something he's run on in the past is getting rid of regulatory burdens. And nuclear is a market where we, we need to rethink those things. We need to make sure that we're cautious, though, because safety is critical when it comes to nuclear, more so than any other industry. Um, I think that if I were optimistic is that I think with a Trump or Biden administration coming to, to power in, in the next election is that both will view nuclear as a national security asset, not only locally in terms of how you power data centers, but also how you deploy these systems globally to ensure that the U.S. has influence in countries across the global south, which are now looking at nuclear today. What do you think is missing from the conversation then when it comes to nuclear? Any misconceptions out there that you want to clear up? Yeah, I think the, the biggest misconception with nuclear is that something we've touched on a number of times is whether the juice is worth the squeeze, whether the price is really worth paying up front. And I think the answer is definitively yes. Um, and the case study I would point to here is France versus Germany. We essentially saw an energy crisis play out in Europe when Russia went to war with Ukraine uh, and we had the natural gas pipelines cut. These two countries had totally different responses. Germany, who was praised by many countries as being a leader in clean energy because of their investments in wind and solar, was really the person or the country that people were really looking as the most forward-looking nation in, in energy. Now what happened is when that natural gas got cut, what they brought online was coal. They have about the dirtiest grid in Europe. They had a spike in energy prices that have undercut their entire industrial output. They're still below uh, pre-COVID levels of industrial output and are the only country in Europe like that. France, on the other hand, where 70% of their baseload power comes from nuclear, has maintained relatively steady prices. And that really is the key here, is that how does the U.S. start to build a resilient grid with nuclear? And I think that's by making these large capital investments today, making sure there's public support that's helping induce private investment, which, to be quite frank, is, is why investors like me, Albert Wenger at Union Square Ventures, Kevin Ryan at Alicorp, one of the founding executives of Google X, are backing companies like Transmutex, because uh, we think this is happening. That brings up a really interesting point. I guess something I want to get at is, is this going to cost the everyday American once nuclear does become more prolific? Because as of now, the, United, or the White House said back in May, there's about 19% of nuclear being used right now when it comes to total energy. Yeah, I think that over time, it's going to save the American consumer money. Uh, the reason is, is that if you look at the levelized cost of electricity, once you have one of these plants in up and running, they can be below the cost of a, a coal plant. Now, you have to get past those, those upfront costs, and, and that's a real investment. But it, pay div it pays dividends over the long run in the sense that you have guaranteed power. These reactors operate 24-7. They're incredibly reliable. If you start to overinvest in renewables, wind and solar, you start to need to have backup systems. When the wind isn't blowing, you need natural gas to come online, and all of a sudden you're managing a grid with lots of fluctuations. And so the really easy way to have a grid that's stable and easy to manage is having reliable power. And that's where nuclear is going to th thrive. And if we can start to solve some of the key problems that made nuclear costly in the past at a system scale, 
namely nuclear waste. I think that this is something that people don't realize is that the U.S. government is paying around $500 million per year to nuclear facility operators to, in order to keep their waste on site because we haven't been able to build a centralized storage facility. And so if we can invest in systems like Transmutex that are all of a sudden turn these costs into assets, aka more energy and more fuel, we can start to make nuclear an even more attractive technology than it is today. And, that, and that's really the opportunity. The theme, Cameron, in the conversation has been that progress in nuclear has been slow in the United States. So what is next for Transmutex? We're talking to a variety of governments about where we want to deploy the first system. That'll really be a, a hallmark system that will then give other countries around the world the opportunity to evaluate it. Uh, we're going to be raising up to $500 million over the next several years in order to test and license that. Uh, and I think what's exciting is that we're hoping to put it in a position where it can be brought to the U.S. market in order to address the major concerns we've talked about here, fuel security, waste management, and ultimately providing reliable power to things like AI and, and other industries. I am curious, does Transmutex have the monopoly when it comes to recycling nuclear waste, or is there other competition out there? There's other systems. I think Sam Altman has a system called Oklo, and, and these are generally fast reactor systems that can also use waste as, as fuel. Now, the real challenge is that it's a question of how much waste can you actually burn effectively. And, and this is really where having a system like Transmutex that uses the particle accelerator thrives. Because you have a particle accelerator and you operate the system subcritically, so with a larger safety margin, it means you can use a lot more alternative fuel, meaning a lot more waste. So we can burn at a higher efficiency really than any other system. And that's what makes it incredibly unique. Cameron Porter, I appreciate you coming in today. Thank you so much for the conversation. Thank you for the time, Brittany. It was exceptional.